I'm going to speak today on where do the storms come from and who's going to be ready for the final storm. Now, you'd say, Brother Olaf, do you believe that Jesus sends storms of destruction, tears up people's lives, and tears up their houses, floats their little babies down the creek? You believe Jesus wills that? I mean, who got us in this kind of a fix anyhow? It's easy to say that the Lord blew things away. He might have permitted it, but God is not a God of destruction, even though sometimes we'd like to make him one. His arm is an arm of salvation and love and mercy. And if you study the book of Job that we preached on, God didn't afflict Job. You read, there's a verse that says, God does not afflict willingly. In other words, it's not his will to afflict. It's God's will to make whole. It's God's will to cure and not to kill. Then the question would have to be answered, where do the storms come from? From the fence of the power there, the devil himself. But, let me give you something. When we do not recognize God, and we are not controlled by the Lord, then we'll be controlled by the devil. And therefore, the times of judgment are on. And now, the devil brought the destruction upon Job. Where did the cure come from? The Lord. What did he say? He said the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Didn't say the Lord sent it on. The devil said, I tell you what I want you to do. You do so and so to Job. The Lord said, you do it. You bring in destruction, you do it. You're the daddy of disease, put it on him. Can't no disease come out of me. If he catches what I've got, he'll be made well. I mean, why can't people see that? You think Jesus ever lay in the bed with sickness? Not on your life. And I don't have time to go into all of this because it'd take a lot of time and then a bunch of you'd go away mad because it'd interfere with your theology. Yeah, that's right, your traditional outlook. And so therefore, I don't have the time to go into it and study, as far as I'm concerned, all the way through the Old and the New Testament. But I tell you one thing, God does not will the death of any. God does not willingly afflict. But when we get so far away from God until we refuse to be dealt with by the Spirit, then the flesh is going to have to be dealt with. What is the lesson that we're supposed to learn? Well, first place, it wasn't a surprise to God. But the one thing that we need to get in our heart, if we're in the perfect will of God, we're ready for any storm that comes. Nothing can stop God's people if they walk with the Lord. And so in Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger, great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind, and in the storm, and the clouds of the dust of his feet. Now, he didn't say that the storm was his will, but he said he had his way in the storm. See, God's bigger than the storm. And the devil doesn't ever stop God with a storm. And I'll tell you something else. The devil will never stop God's children with a storm. God's children will never be defeated in the storm. Listen, our best days as Christians have always been in the storm. God's people have always been better when they were crowded to their knees in any other way. Prosperity has never been a friend of man. Prosperity has caused us many times to drift away from the Lord. Now you have your Bible. Turn with me to the book of Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. I love the book of Mark. Dear friends, this old book hasn't changed. And Jesus hadn't changed. And we're not going to raise better boys while they sit in the laps of harlots from Hollywood. And when that dirty record begins to improve and get white and pure and bring saints from sinners, then I'll tune my eyes to look your way. But I'm just going by the awful facts that we've got to face in our generation. And that goes for grandmas and grandpas, preachers and preachers' wives and kids. I don't believe it's God's will for God's preacher's boys to be delinquent boys and to be thieves and sniff glue and uh, drink liquor and smoke cigarettes. I believe it's God's will for his preachers to keep first their own vineyard. And I want to say to the preacher brethren here, there's not a kid in town the devil would rather have than yours. And he'll work overtime on your children. You'll have heartaches and heartbreaks. You just claim the promises of God. 
And God will deliver your children, I believe, into a godly life. In Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 35. The same day, 435. And the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. That's one of the most enticing and exciting scriptures that's in the Bible. There were with him also other little ships. Other little ships were with him. Now that's the trouble with most of us. And so far as we know, these disciples were not concerned about those other little ships. Most of us are just so content if our ship makes it in the harbor. But dear friends, you might need to be reminded that unless you help some other little ship get in, you may not make it yourself. Amen. There are other little ships. And uh, I've enjoyed preaching on uh, the great shipbuilding corporation. The greatest ship that has ever built. Of course, a lot of ships, but I won't go into those such as fellowship, friendship, stewardship, relationship. That's a great ship. But the greatest ship that's ever built was lordship. That's the lordship. Now I'm on that ship. And I got on the lordship by relationship. And ever since I've had good fellowship, he said there were other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. The waves beat into the ship so it was now full. I've been in the water long enough to know that when the ship gets full of water, it's time to sink. Now I've enjoyed being in the water and the boat being in the water, but never have I enjoyed when the water got in the boat. And I've seen so much of it get in that it went down. And it was time for me to start swimming. And I did too. Now I could have said, Lord, I just want you to send a helicopter some it's midnight nearly dark, way out in the bay, wind blowing, waves are rolling. I could have said, now Lord, I'm just going to sit right here on top of this water. And you said, no, I didn't. I said, Lord, I'm going to swim as long as I can. And if I give out, you send something. I don't have much patience. These people said, well, I believe I could just sit down on a railroad track. And it wasn't the Lord's will for me to be killed. He'd stop every train to wreck them one. I don't think he'd wreck a whole train just for you. You're not that important. <laughs> he'd probably let that cow catcher sail through you. You haven't got sense enough to get off a railroad track. I mean, you ought to be done something to. But I got another lesson out of this, and that is you can be with Jesus and still get in the storm. I mean, Jesus right there in the boat with him, but the storm still came. A lot of this little silly modernistic preaching today said, well, y'all just get on the old ship of Zion, sail down the river of golden dreams and your worries over and your troubles and your problems and there'll never be any heartaches and you'll have a full dinner, pay lower taxes and higher wages. That's not so. And I've known people that got saved and they come running to me and said, Brother Wolf, it don't work. I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, the preacher told me if I got saved, all my problems were over with. And I mean, I just ever, well, he said, it's been worse since I've been saying it's ever been. He said, I'm barely making it. I mean, I said, well, praise God if you're just making it. I don't know of any of the devil's kids that's making it, do you? Amen. Let me tell you something, dear friend. God doesn't promise you all shallow water. He doesn't always let his children stay on a four lane. Sometimes he may put you on what you think is a detour. But you'll find something on that detour that you wouldn't have found on the main line. Dear friends, the best lessons I've ever learned have been in the valleys. Haven't been when smiles were coming, but when tears were rolling. Those were the best lessons I've ever learned all of my life. Oh, listen, there were times when I thought I was being killed. But really, I was being cured. I mean, God was meeting some needs and proving to me that he was the God of the storm. And I'll say this, most of my ministry has been lived in a storm. And yet, I believe I have found the peaceful place in the storm. And that's God's will and the word of God. I mean, the storms, really, if you ever get to where you have been in a lot of storms, and God's presence is so precious, you'd rather be in a storm with him than out of a storm without him. And I'll guarantee you one thing. If you want to know whether the Lord is with you or not, get in a good old-fashioned storm, and then you'll find out. No, dear friends. God didn't promise the way would be always easy. But he did say, when thou passest through the rivers or through the waters, I'll be with thee. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. I read through the book, most of the book of Daniel. That'll strengthen anybody's faith. The little captured boy. 
Just like in the book of Job, the secret of Daniel's deliverance was nothing in the world but the word of God. And that bunch of haters, they despised him because he wouldn't drink wine. He wouldn't eat a bunch of greasy meat. Had a bunch of filth in the way they doctored it up. He said, that wouldn't be good for my system. <laughs> he said, that defile me. And so they said, well, we, we know there's no way for us to catch him except with the law. I mean, the only thing he got to talk about is the word. He won't talk about the word. And said, we ought to make a decree. We ought to make a decree that it would not be permissible for anybody to call on anybody except the king for 30 days. Why, listen, a lot of church members go 30 days and never pray. But Daniel wouldn't attempt to go 30 days without praying. Notice two things go together, the word and prayer. Listen, you haven't got sense enough to pray unless you know about the word. If you abide in me, my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. And that's the reason I tell our men, and some of them are here today, you'll never learn to pray till you learn to read the word of God. I came out of the jail in Corpus Christi one day, and a little Latin American friend came and said, Brother Olaf, would you bring me a prayer book? And I said, I'll be glad to. Fact is, I got one right here. Oh, he said, sure. I said, uh-huh. Just keep it. Here's the Bible. That's the prayer book. And the main prayer book in the Bible is the book of Psalms. No man ever learns to pray until he learns the book of Psalms. And I don't think any man ever really gets real sanctified wisdom except through the book of Proverbs. You read the book of Psalms if you want to talk to God. You read the book of Proverbs if you want to learn how to talk to men. Daniel stayed with the book. Therefore, he prayed three times a day. The decree was signed. The king thought it was a good idea, but he didn't know it was going to affect one of his favorite servants by the name of Daniel. Daniel, knowing that the decree was signed, went into his place and opened the window and prayed. Now, that would have been a good time to close them, wouldn't it? But Daniel did not change his policy just because somebody signed an ungodly decree. And I tell you, we ought to learn some things. You say, well, things are different, and people are different, and times are different. Let me tell you something. Daniel's God's not different. And he left his windows open and prayed just like he'd been praying. And, of course, you know that bunch of tattletales ran to the king. They found said he's praying just like he always prayed. And the king regretted that he'd passed. Well, he said, don't forget the law of the Medes and Persians can never change. Dear friends, I know somebody that's more unchangeable than the law of the Medes and the Persians. And I know somebody more powerful than the law of the Medes and the Persians. And so they came and the king said, all right, get him and throw him in the lion's den. You know, even the king testified and said his God will protect him. Boy, when you live in such a way that a godless king will start testifying for your God, you've had your light turned on. And Daniel was throwing the lion's den. And so far as we know, the only one that didn't rest during the night was the king. The Bible said he couldn't sleep a wink. Old Daniel, I think, just sort of curled up in the midst of all that bunch of lions, got a good night's rest. The Bible said that an angel, God sent an angel and locked the jaws. And you know, I really believe there's some preaching that could be done. I believe we still got a lot of lions who need their jaws locked. I stand in the shadow of over 2,000 lonely men. And I'll guarantee you, there'll be buckets of tears shed inside those old gray coal walls. You know it. Old mothers got out of the cars and off of the buses and walked up that old lonely, hard, cold concrete street got their pass and stepped inside and saw that boy that they sang to as he lay his little old head on her breast years ago. And yet the world makes no allowance at all. There's no way, there's no hope, never can come back. He's gone down a trail and there's no return. But I believe that Jesus is the answer. Christ can save. I told you about one man that killed seven people. Two outside and five inside the prison and yet he stands with the Bible in his hand on this day telling the whole world and demonstrating the power of God to save. And we sing in our churches and don't believe a word of it. We sing about it, talk about it, but we give God no credit for being able to save to the uttermost those who come unto God. Listen, I wish I could demonstrate something to you. This little girl in the front, that's right. This little girl is the preacher's daughter. 
brought up, I know, in a fine Christian home. But I want you to get something. It doesn't take any more of the grace of God or the blood of Christ to save the wickedest criminal in the federal prison right up here than it does to save this little girl. It's a horrible thought, but in this little heart without Christ lies the possibility of every dirty crime that's ever been committed by anybody that's in the penitentiary. And yet you don't believe that. You believe it's too hard for God to save an old criminal, an old convict. But I tell you one thing, if we loved them and prayed for them like we ought, they could still be redeemed. And uh, just preach the word to them every day and pray with them every day and get the word of God every day. Don't you worry about the word. It'll do its work. Now, Christians, they were with Jesus, but the storm came anyhow. Now arose a great storm of wind. The waves beat in the ship, so it was now full. He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? It's a foolish accusation. And that's not the way to get out of the storm. I mean, that's no way to get the water out of the boat. I mean, that's not the bilge pump you need. They said, don't you care? Now, you know what? When they saw Jesus laying up on the pillow sound asleep, they thought, well, he sure doesn't care. He's gone to sleep. It just means that he wasn't worried. I mean, he wasn't chewing his fingernails. And he wasn't running up and down the ship wondering what to do. He was sound asleep. You know, sometimes I think the Lord, in a sense, goes to sleep in order to wake us up. And then he does something else. I think he goes to sleep in order to make us realize we're just not sufficient to take care of the storm ourselves. And brother, we better go wake him up. We better call on him. And dear friends, I'm glad that he was willing to wake up, aren't you? I believe Jesus could have floated out across the waves of sleep and made it. Of course, they'd all drown. I mean, the devil, he knew he couldn't drown Jesus. I believe he could have gone across the sea and never got the pillow wet. <laughs> now, that makes you stupid in the eyes of the world and the martyrs, but I don't care. I, I believe God can do anything and usually does. The fact is, he's already done it and done everything and done it well. See, But they came and said, carest thou not? And that's where we get in trouble. We blame God for the storm when God seeks to reveal himself in the storm. The Bible said he hath his way in the whirlwind. Think about this little whirlwind. And also in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. Now, let's go on because I want to come to the lesson in just a minute. They said, Cast thou not that we perish. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace! Be still. He called for peace. You know what peace is? He just called his name. That's Jesus. He's peace. He could have said amen and been just as good. Because amen's Jesus. Because he is the amen. Isn't that what the Bible says? That's the reason the devil hates a good old hearty amen because it mentions Jesus. That's the reason some of you folks can't holler amen because you don't want to get that close to Jesus. That's the reason some of the preachers said, you know what, people saying amen, it bothers me. It bothers me when you don't. He arose and rebuked the wind, said unto the sea, peace, be still. I always get the picture that the old sea lay down, the old waves just laid flat down all of a sudden, just like a trained dog. Got me got in the corner and said, okay. The wind got calm. The wind ceased. And there was what? Didn't say a calm, said it's a great calm. It's a supernatural calm. It got calm so quick they knew it didn't do it accidentally. And the disciples, wait a minute. He said unto them, where are y'all so scared? Where are y'all afraid of? Can't you see Jesus? His heart never did beat an extra beat. Then what are you all afraid of? Why are you so fearful? I know what's wrong with you. No faith. He told them. Jesus raises all the questions that need to be raised and he answers all that needs to be answered. The first time he diagnosed their trouble. I mean, he raised the question and then he diagnosed uh, their trouble and the need. He said, no faith. He didn't say no education. You don't learn how to stop storms off at Baylor or seminary. You might learn how to get in a lot of them, but I tell you, now, I don't mean to be ugly. God knows my heart, but I'm scared of education, the kind we've got today. Our preachers are coming out of school without enough knowledge or faith to know what to do when the storm comes. I mean, actually, they know nothing to do except to hunt up a psychiatrist. And listen, we grow in churches the same way. The average church member can't find the answer for himself to save his life. If he can't find his pastor, he's sunk. Let me tell you something, dear friends. I believe that God will tell every child of his own how to get through the valley and how to get through the storm. Thank you for joining us today on the Family Altar Program with Lester Roloff. You may listen to the preaching and the special music of the Family Altar Program 24 hours a day 
when you visit our ministry website, roloff.org. We love hearing from our listeners. If this broadcast has been a blessing to you, please write to us at Roloff Evangelistic Enterprises, P.O. Box 100, Fort Thomas, Arizona, 85536. Again, that's Roloff Evangelistic Enterprises, P.O. Box 100, Fort Thomas, Arizona, 85536. This broadcast is made possible by the prayers and financial support of listeners like you. Thank you for partnering with us, and remember that Christ is the answer.